Why have Western nations failed to develop successful hypersonic missiles? When a missile trailing a long, fiery wake pierces the sky, leaping and gliding at the edge of the atmosphere at 10 or even 20 times the speed of sound, any air defense system in its path is rendered obsolete. For China, such a scenario is no longer theoretical, but a reality embodied in operational hardware like the Dongfeng 17 DF-17 and the YJ-21. Meanwhile, in Western countries, such projects are repeatedly stalled, unable to move beyond the laboratory. The Pentagon has canceled its second hypersonic weapon program in three years, with hundreds of millions of dollars washed away. In 2025, the U.S. Navy dejectedly announced that its carrier killer Halo hypersonic missile project was terminated. This marked the second major hypersonic program the U.S. military had scrapped in just three years a costly endeavor that ended with the missile never even leaving the confines of its own lab. A Russian expert pointedly remarked that the United States lacks the technology to process advanced titanium alloys and cannot solve the problem of control and maneuverability. Hypersonic weapons generate extreme heat, and American equipment simply cannot withstand it. More critically, the U.S. military is running out of the resources for trial and error. Its existing wind tunnels can only simulate conditions up to Mach 6, making it impossible to replicate the flight environment for large-scale vehicles at speeds above Mach 8. To conduct tests, they are forced to launch actual prototypes in an incredibly expensive process that involves burning money on live launches and using assets like Global Hawk drones as temporary trackers. To understand the challenge, consider an analogy to build a sports car that remains perfectly stable in a hurricane is it better to drive the car directly into a typhoon or to simulate the storm with a giant fan in a laboratory? The latter illustrates the core logic of a wind tunnel. Every vehicle that flies must first pass the wind tunnel test. It is an industry axiom that a new generation of wind tunnels enables a new generation of aircraft. The development of any aerial vehicle requires thousands of wind tunnel experiments to refine its shape, validate materials, and calculate its trajectory. Without this step, so-called supercomputer simulations are nothing more than a paper exercise. No matter how powerful a computer cannot accurately calculate the chaotic state of air molecules ionizing and dissociating under extreme high temperatures. China possesses two nation-defining strategic assets that cover the entire hypersonic flight corridor. The first is the JF-12 shock tunnel, a 265-meter-long dragon capable of generating wind speeds up to Mach 9 making it the world's first facility to replicate such flight conditions on the ground. The second is the JF-22, an even more advanced hypervelocity wind tunnel that passed its evaluations in 2023. It can simulate flight at 30 times the speed of sound at an altitude of 90 kilometers, where temperatures can reach a staggering 10,000 degrees Celsius. While Chinese engineers can simply place a missile model in a wind tunnel and blow on it, their Western counterparts can only look on in envy. France once sought to rent time in China's Mach 10 wind tunnel, but balked at the 200 million euro price tag. The European Space Agency, ESA, inquired about using the Mach 20 facility and was quoted 500 million euros, but the deal ultimately fell through over conditions related to data sharing. Even the United States testing the waters through Japan was deterred by a prohibitive asking price of $5 billion. This was not a case of China making exorbitant demands. Rather, its facilities were so busy that high prices served as a polite refusal. The United States had not been idle. As early as the 1950s, they led the world in theoretical research on hypersonic technology. The X-51A Waverider program once set a record of Mach 6. But this technological path was incredibly difficult. A scramjet engine must operate stably in temperatures exceeding 3,000 degrees Celsius, requiring solutions for material defects in the combustion chamber and communication blackouts caused by the plasma sheath. In contrast, China and Russia took a more pragmatic shortcut. Russia's Kinzhal missile was created by modifying the existing Iskander ballistic missile to achieve Mach 10 glide capability. China's DF-17 utilizes a wave rider design executing a Xian Shushin trajectory that skips along the edge of the atmosphere. This boost glide approach relies on mature, cost-effective technology. The United States, by stubbornly pursuing overly ambitious and complex solutions, fell behind by at least five years. The problem was compounded by internal rivalries between military branches. The Navy developed its HALO program while the Air Force pursued its own hypersonic project. Though the technologies were similar, each service established its own silo-dispersing funding and talent 
which ultimately led to both programs failing. Today, China's wind tunnel technology is unrivaled, yet its journey began as a desperate counterattack from a state of utter poverty. In 1956, Chan Shui-sen established the Institute of Mechanics at the Chinese Academy of Sciences and wrote to his junior colleague, Guo Yonghui, who was still in the United States, come back quickly. There are many important things that need you. Guo Yonghui immediately burned all his unpublished papers and boarded a ship back to China with his wife and daughter. He tasked his graduate student, Yu Hongru, with tackling the challenge of shock tunnel technology, giving him two requirements, save money and succeed. At the time, the international standard was to use mechanical compressors to build wind tunnels with a single nozzle costing millions. Yu Hongru chose an unconventional path detonating explosives inside a tube. We had many accidents later on, recalled Yu Hongru now in his 90s with a calm demeanor. The worst one blew up the laboratory building. When asked what happened next, he said, it blew up, so they just rebuilt it for us. The method was certainly cost effective, as the new China had a surplus of explosives, but it was also incredibly dangerous, relying on the sheer courage of the researchers. From the bombed out ruins of that laboratory, the world-shaking theory of detonation-driven shock tunnels was born. In 1958, the first generation shock tube was successfully developed a breakthrough from zero to one. This was followed by the JF-4A reflected shock tunnel in 1964, and in 1997, the world's first detonation-driven shock tunnel, the JF-10. However, his mentor, Guo Yonghui, did not live to see it all. On December 5, 1968, after discovering a set of critical data at a base in Qinghai, he boarded a flight back to Beijing to save time. The plane crashed. In the final moments before impact, he and his security guard, Mu Fangdong, embraced tightly using their bodies to shield the briefcase containing the vital thermonuclear missile data. When rescue workers tearfully separated their charred remains, the data inside the briefcase was found completely intact. 22 days later, China's first thermonuclear missile test was a success. Before his sacrifice, Guo Yonghui had told Yu Hongru, conditions in our country are difficult. It will be hard for our generation to achieve great results, but we are willing to be the paving stones to let the next generation stand higher. He never imagined that this first generation of paving stones would themselves create miracles. In 2016, the JF-12 wind tunnel team received the highest honor in the international aerospace community. The ground testing award from the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics AIA, the first time in its 41 year history, the award was given to an Asian team. Today at 97, Yu Hongru remains active in research, but insists on giving the credit to the younger generation. The stage is built, he says, it is up to them to perform well. And the West, the wind tunnel technology left behind by Chan Shui-sen and Guo Yonghui's own mentor, Theodore von Karman, has long since faded from its former glory due to a talent gap and the loss of foundational knowledge. The United States once possessed the world's earliest Mach 2.75 supersonic wind tunnel with Chan Shui-sen himself on the design team. But with the departure of such masters and no successors to take their place, even achieving stable tests above Mach 6 has become a luxury. So when someone asks why China is rolling out one hypersonic missile after another, the answer is not found in a laboratory supercomputer. It is found in the 265 meter long JF-12 Dragon in Huairu Science City. It is found in the ruins of Yu Hongru's blasted out laboratory. And it is found in the briefcase that Guo Yonghui protected with his life. The West remains trapped in a labyrinth of technological debate and a hollowed out basic research infrastructure. China over 70 years has proven an iron law, the foundation of a great nation's strategic power is never a stroke of genius. It is a ladder built in a storm with one generation standing on the shoulders of another. When Yu Hongru smiles before the camera and says, I am just trying to do a little something following his example, what stretches out behind him is not just the steel corridor of a wind tunnel, but a celestial path to the skies paved with faith and blood.